will uh, start with the spinal biomechanics talk by, do by Dr. Cruyff. It's on. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, tell you about the essential biomechanics in the spine and especially how this uh, translates to unique problems in the, in the human situation. Uh, I'm Moyel Kruid, I'm an orthopedic uh, spine surgeon in uh, the UMC Utrecht, which is very uh, nearby. So during this talk, you will learn uh, what this uh, beautiful uh, Roman bridge actually has to do with uh, essential spinal biomechanics. First, I think all of you know, but again, we need to recognize that the spine is, is a troublemaker, a big troublemaker. If you look at the burden of disease list uh, for, uh, for decades, you will always see that uh, low back pain is number one. And it's not only in welfare countries, it's everywhere in the world. So this means it is not a cultural thing or related to, to a way of living. It is inherent to the way that the human is using a spine. So we should think, why, why is this happening? Why do humans have so much back problems? And a very logical example of uh, uh, explanation of cause is that it has something to do with the anatomy of, of human. And I will explain that later on. But there's another factor uh, which is obviously very important, and that is that humans get much older than they are uh, intended to be. From an evolutionary point of view, humans should be only 40 or 50 years old, uh, but they get older and older, and that's where trouble starts. So is the spine itself a problem? Well, I don't think so. If you look uh, at evolution, you will find that uh, the, the, the design of the spine, the vertebral column, is a very age, ancient and successful design. It was developed 500 million years ago, and since that time, all uh, animals are actually divided into uh, vertebrates and non-vertebrates, which indicates how successful this design is. Looking at spines, when you are in a museum, you will also find that the enormous vertebrae of dinosaurs and the, the, the tiny vertebrae of frogs are very much like the human vertebrae. So in other words, the design itself, the, 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 the anatomy itself is not a problem. If you look at the development of the spine, it's nice to see that the first spines actually developed as a way uh, in, uh, as, as a, as, as a um, possibility for, for movement and muscle attachment. These, these first primordial vertebrates, they actually used their spine only for movement, which gave them a big advantage to other animals. Uh, you can still see this, this, this movement in the coronal plane uh, in the uh, early uh, uh, animals that came to land, the, the amphibians and the reptiles. They all move in a, in a wobbling, coronal fashion on land. Later on, uh, uh, it was clear that longer legs gave an advantage. Animals could go much faster, and they had to change their movement in the coronal plane to a movement in the sagittal plane. The sagittal movement allowed a very uh, high speed, especially if they had a very good fixation of the hind legs to the spine. And this fixation, uh, slowly evolved to be what we nowadays know as the sacrum. Well, this is a bit of the evolution of the spine. Now, in this image, I show you what is the, the concept of the spine and the sacrum. And here we see this Roman arch again. All these structures are uh, self-stabilizing structures. And that is very important to recognize. A kyphotic arch, like a kyphotic spine, is safe self-stabilizing. The more weight you put, put on it, the more stable it will get. And the same accounts for the sacrum. If you consider your legs as the pillars of a, of a dome, uh, the sacrum will be the keystone. Yeah, so in both that direction as in the sagittal direction, the self-supporting arch concept is uh, very important. 
It does not mean that animals always have to stand on their forelegs. They can stand straight, but they will always maintain this kyphotic spine, the self-supporting kyphotic spine. So if they want to stand straight, they have to, to have to flex their knees and hips, which costs a lot of energy. And that's the reason probably why the human decided to completely free up his forelegs uh, and this allowed the human to, to use tools, to, to have an, an enormous amount of advantages which we see uh, nowadays. But to free his forelegs without losing energy, human had to convert his C-shaped spine into an S-shaped spine. And that is what human makes you unique. They have a spine that was intended to be a kyphotic spine, but now has become an S-shaped spine. Is that a problem? Probably, yes, that is a problem. Because this S-shaped spine has completely different uh, loading patterns. This S-shaped spine has uh, shear forces that are absolutely not uh, present in any other uh, spine, uh, only in the human. And one of the most important and unique shear forces is the posterior directed shear forces, which we find in the thoracolumbar area. And if we look at the low lumbar area, we see an enormous uh, uh, anterior shear force. And in addition to this, the whole spine must be stabilizing, stabilized with a, a posterior tether, and this is symbolized by this, this crane. You cannot straight stand straight as a human without a very strong bend on the posterior side because your load line, your, your plump line, is anterior to your spine. And this has many consequences for the way we look at the spine and how we treat the spine. So, first of all, something about the shear force as well. Obviously, uh, you understand that the anterior shear force in the lower uh, uh, lumbar will cause uh, lysthesis uh, and all problems uh, related to that. Remember, many children, uh, soon after they start walking around, develop a spondylolysis. It definitely has to do with the, with the uh, um, anterior shear forces. The dorsally directed shear forces are even more interesting because these dorsally directed shear forces actually uncouple the stabilizing mechanism. The spine becomes instable because of the dorsal shear and that's probably one of the reasons that we see scoliosis. Finally, actual loading is not unique to the human spine of course, but in combination with this posterior tether uh, that is needed is a very important driver for many problems. So looking at the path pathologies related to these shear forces, uh, all of you uh, will experience yourself or in your practice uh, the consequences of anterior shear. And that starts with uh, facet degeneration, which is inherent to the high forces in the lower back. Um, in combination with disc uh, degeneration, it will finally result in a narrowing, narrowing of the canal and a well-known uh, stenosis problems. Uh, the posterior shear, as I said, is more unique. Uh, as a neurosurgeon, you probably will not often uh, see patients, young patients with a scoliosis, which is a very, uh, very specific uh, disease uh, that we treat uh, uh, mostly as, as orthopedic surgeons. Um, but the same mechanism that you see in the idiopathic adolescent scoliosis most likely is just as much the mechanism with which what we see in degenerative scoliosis. Remember, the posterior directed shear forces are present in the thoracolumbar area, and we typically see this degenerative scoliosis in the L1, L2 uh, area as a combination of instability due to posterior shear and uh, degeneration of the disc. Um, if we treat a scoliosis, the interesting thing is that it is not so difficult to, to, to align the spine in the, in the coronal and the sagittal plane, but it is very important to always recognize that 
the human spine has this S shape, and that means that the sagittal plane and the sagittal contour is very important. Especially if you go low, you always need to uh, consider the the, the uh, lumbar lordosis that is needed to maintain a sagittal balance. What you can see in this image is that despite the sagittal balance and the coronal plane have been restored well, there is still a lot of rotation in that spine. You can see it from the direction of the pedicle screws, and that is the main driver for scoliosis, as I told you. The axial loading uh, we know as orthopedic surgeons mostly as the Scheuermann disease, uh, which is typically occurring uh, during growth as, as a kind of a growth disturbance. Normally you don't need to treat it, but if it's really getting uh, bad, a posterior fusion is very uh, effective to restore sagittal balance. Again, be aware that you are not over-treating it or making the um, lumbar area too flat. Another consequence of extra loading, as I told you, is the, is the um, uh, effect that it also has on the posterior tether. If a spine fractures, which is uh, often happening, especially in osteoporotic uh, uh, patients, um, the anterior side will collapse. That itself is not the big problem. The big problem comes when the posterior tensio tensionment is disrupted. I'm not sure how, how you are referring to it, but we usually call this the posterior ligamentary complex, PLC. And if we look at, at, at fractures, all fractures are actually divided in stable or non-stable, and this is determined by the integrity of that PLC. We typically use the AO classification. We say if the PLC is ruptured, this is a B-type fracture. This means it has a tendency to collapse in kyphosis in time. If the PLC is intact, you basically don't need to worry about the fracture. And of course, as if all uh, ligaments are torn, we are talking about a C-type of fracture uh, that is instable by itself. This is an example I wanted to show you about, which, which clearly, which, which nicely shows you the, the different forces that are uh, present in the spine and the different principles that we see in the spine. This was a 38-year-old man. He fell from a height. He landed on his feet. He had no neurological signs. He had no fractures of his legs. He was hemodynamically stable. Um, and this is what we see on the x-rays. And Maybe we should start at, 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 the, at the sacrum. What you see here is a destruction of that keystone. That is what I was telling you. The keystone is the main support for that arc between the two legs. His leg remained intact. That means somewhere something has to break, and that is the keystone. That's number one problem. Then in the other direction, you see that kyphotic moment uh, of the uh, lower lumbar or the S1 in this case, this means this guy has a lumbopelvic dissociation, which is a very instable uh, fracture. Finally, he has the um, fracture of the vertebra. Is that a problem, that vertebral fracture? Thoracolumbar, anyone? Should we leave it like this, or? <laughs> what do you say? That makes sense what you are saying, definitely. That's always always good to do. But based on this CT, would this be a A-type fracture? Is this only a vertebral body that, that is fractured, or do you see more? That, and it's maybe difficult for you to see, but... Oh, it's not a lamina, it's actually a lamina. Exactly. It's, I wouldn't call it the lamina, I would call it the, 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 the interfer in interfacet area. But this, this, this is... This is by definition a PLC injury, which means that as soon as he is going to stand up, he will uh, collapse. Yeah, so the integrity of his PLC is damaged, and integrity of the whole self-supporting sacrum is damaged, so he needs some um, fixations. Uh, actually, for the PLC in the torcolumbar area, that is 
pretty easy to do with percutaneous systems. Uh, that's that's a very efficient way to 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 restore the PLC. It can be removed after uh, a half a year. The sacrum is a bit more difficult. Um, you need some bridge between the two iliac wings. We typically use what we call uh, sacral alar uh, screws, but important is to connect the two with this this rod because that rod stabilizes actually the forces that are on the keystone. And for the lumbopelvic fracture, a posterior fixation, just a classic one, uh, will do the job. So what I want to give you as a take-home message is that the design of the spine by itself is actually not meant for the vertical loading that we do as a human. And that is the reason, especially in combination with the aging of the spine, of a lot of problems. Um, there are different uh, uh, different forces due to this this uh, uh, loading of the spine, which cause different diseases like the spondylolisthesis, scoliosis, uh, which are very human specific. If we are talking about spine fractures, keep in mind that that crane, the posterior ligamentary complex, is the is the main uh, main uh, item that tells you if it's stable or not. And finally, for especially lumbar spine uh, surgery, keep in mind that the whole spine should be in balance. And this is what we refer to as the sacrifice uh, balance. Good time. Yeah, very, very nice talk uh, indeed. Uh, any questions? So we have to take care of the sagittal balance more than coronal balance. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yes. So the question was, what's yeah. happened with the cross connector over the sacrum? Yeah. Um, there's not much soft tissue cover. Yeah. Do you leave it in thin patients? What would you do? Can you remove it once the fracture is healed? Yeah. Well, to start with the last question, yes, absolutely. This 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 cross connector is serving a temporal uh, reason to to allow this, the fracture to heal. If it would not give any problems, I would leave it because it doesn't prevent anything. Uh, and in general, that's definitely an issue. All all. all sacral fixation, sacral screws, especially iliac screws, are, are, are uh, notorious for, for uh, uh, wound problems, um, ulcers, and, and cetera, yeah. yeah. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you a lot. <laughs>